So there's some compelling work here to suggest that people make better decisions, at least when these decisions are complex, um, after periods of unconscious thinking. And you know, it's, it's a kind of a counterintuitive finding, you know, because it's typically you don't think about going and distracting yourself with the, you know, reciting a phone number as being something that's going to facilitate your decision making. But the argument here is that with complex decisions, a brief period of distraction where your brain can unconsciously process this information can be uh, uh, advantageous for your decision making. So this is all well and good, but I think one question that really guided our research was, you know, how is the brain supporting this type of unconscious processing of information? We used um, neuroimaging, unlike these previous studies, to see if we could actually find how the brain uh, is, you know, producing uh, these better decisions when people do distractor tasks. Essentially, we had people do the same sort of task with cars and different items, uh, and then this distractor, uh, but while they were in the scanner. So they went through and they read information about the cars, and uh, they did this distractor while we were using brain imaging. We had three principal findings in this study. The first finding was that um, if you just look at the overall performance scores, we find that this period, in this case it was just a two minute period of unconscious processing, predicted better decision making. So overall decision making scores, we see that um, this period of unconscious processing seems to have some advantages, which is sort of surprising. Just a brief period of two minutes where you're distracted can um, have advantages for helping you make decisions about you know, cars or apartments. Um, so that was our first finding. The second, and that was consistent with with previous research in the area. Uh, the second finding we we had we we saw, um, and this had to do with our brain imaging research, or our brain imaging uh, results, and that's that we found that this period of unconscious processing seemed to be supported by areas of visual cortex and prefrontal cortex. Moreover, we really found uh, support for this reactivation um, hypothesis, such that, that these areas of visual cortex and prefrontal cortex were active both when you were initially learning the information about the cars, but that continued to be active during this period of unconscious processing. Um, and so uh, we, I think for the first time, have some initial evidence to suggest that the brain is active in supporting this type of unconscious processing of information. So that was our second finding. The third finding, um, which I find to be the most compelling, was that the degree to which you reactivated these areas of the visual cortex and prefrontal cortex predicted the quality of your decision. Um, such that the uh, better decision-making scores uh, related to the degree to which you were um, reactivating these brain regions. So really there's a kind of a nice uh, you know, uh, relationship here between this reactivation process we were seeing in the brains uh, related to their actual behavioral decision-making scores. So broadly, our research both helps, I think, um, chip away at this, myster this, this mystery in terms of uh, our unconscious brains and decision making. And uh, it suggests, um, you know, I think the research more broadly suggests that uh, there may be um, contexts in which it's a good idea to actually go sleep on it or to go play tennis um, when we're faced with complex decisions in ways that um, uh, you know, may facilitate our decision making. This research may have important implications for um, uh, really describing how our brains more fundamentally learn um, and particularly learn complex information. Do as many different things that you're interested in as you can. So, you know, you might be reading about physics and then you might be, you know, listening to Brahms or something and then like reading Chekhov. And while you're listening to Brahms, your brain could still be working on the physics stuff that you were reading about. And then later on, while you're reading Chekhov, your brain could still be, you know, giving you a better understanding of the Brahms by unconsciously processing it. So, you know, in order to give your brain these opportunities to unconsciously process things, uh, you should do as many different things as is possible. And we don't really have direct data to support this, but this suggestion is sort of in line with everything that we know about unconscious processing at this point. This initial study, I think, provides a launching ground for lots of new directions for this research. And um, so we've been pursuing a couple of those, but one I think that's really interesting is um, if you look at this very, at this task that we've been, been using, which is exposing people to, uh, uh, you know, four apartments or four cars, you know, a complex consumer product choice task, um, 
you could say, sure, this is about decision making. But if you step back and you look at it, what we're doing is really presenting people with novel information. So four cars you've never heard of before and a bunch of attributes describing each car. So really, as psychologists, our excitement has been to say, this hasn't has less to do with decision making and more to do with how is our brain learn information. And in fact, there's some evidence to suggest that if I give you brand new information about four different cars, um, we can show after a period of unconscious processing that you've learned that information to be able to make a better decision. So really it's about learning. This research was a great um, example um, for how we can get undergraduates here involved at an early age in ways that um, you know, James is, uh, um, you know, he, he actually joined my lab as a freshman and, um, uh, you know, as a sophomore was beginning to develop, um, you know, this research area. And, you know, at, at other schools that I've, I've been at, you know, there haven't been these opportunities that I think um, James has had and others, other students have had in my lab, both with getting undergraduate funding, but then access to be able to, you know, work with professors to, uh, to conduct research. and. Um, uh, you know, my hope is that, you know, people can, um, you know, hear about this work that he's been doing and, and begin to, uh, you know, approach those of us here in psychology or in other areas to, to get involved because um, it is a unique uh, university setting where um, students are given opportunities to, uh, to uh, you know, get involved in research at an early age. One reason that I think that Carnegie Mellon was really like a perfect place to carry this out is there's a lot of effort going into fostering really new directions of research. Um, this project was, you know, in a pretty novel direction that not many people had tried to pursue before. And, uh, you know, luckily there was this grant that was being set up by um, a CMU alumni, uh, Jonathan Rothberg, that was specifically designed to uh, foster new directions um, in human brain imaging, so to support uh, new projects that were really different to uh, different from things that people were currently working on.